God damn, I love my work. This is The Righteous Bro Jambo, and it's time to talk about John Coltrane. The Church of St. John Coltrane is a real thing. It was founded in 1971 in San Francisco and became part of the African Orthodox Church in 1982. Its patron, the legendary tenor man John William Coltrane, has a mythos perhaps unsurpassed in jazz, a man who made his career out of being marveled at and misunderstood, of caressing and bludgeoning, of playing it straight and playing it crooked. And perhaps no one was a more obvious sum of the influences outside of music which shaped him than was John Coltrane. Coltrane was born in 1926 in North Carolina to a poor family, but one that always made time for music. Young John grew up adoring Count Basie and Lester Young and as a teen took up the alto saxophone, practicing constantly at the kitchen table under the encouraging ear of his multi-instrumentalist father. The family moved to New Jersey a few years later with Train staying behind to graduate high school. The 1939 death of his father devastated the younger Coltrane. In 1943, Train made the move north, but he headed for Philadelphia to attend the Orenstein School of Music. But, hoping to avoid the draft and have some control over his fate, Train joined the Navy in August 1945 on the very day the nuclear bomb was dropped on Hiroshima an event which left a deep and ever-abiding impression on him. His outstanding talent, though, did not lay undiscovered long, and for the next year he played in a prestigious Navy swing band, entertaining troops in Hawaii. He got his first professional break with the great jump blues singer Eddie Cleanhead Vinson. Don't ask me how he came to be known as Cleanhead unless you have a very strong stomach, who encouraged Coltrane to move to tenor and then joined Percy Heath's group, where he was first encouraged to explore his experimental side. By 1949, he was in Dizzy Gillespie's group and began to make a name for himself, but he was also addicted to heroin, which began to affect his reliability. In 1954, Duke Ellington hired him, but had to let him go shortly thereafter. Whereas this may have been rock bottom for many musicians, Coltrane found two remarkable patrons willing to take him on for all his frailties. While freelancing in Philadelphia in 1955, a hopelessly addicted Coltrane took a call from the newly cleaned Miles Davis, who was flying high after a triumphant appearance at the Newport Jazz Festival, inviting him to join his quartet. Thus began a relationship which was fractious, to say the least. Coltrane played on five albums with Miles, working, steaming, cooking, relaxing, and round about midnight, before Miles, wary of playing with addicts who may drag him back to his former heroinistic ways, Sack Train, Philly Joe Jones and Red Garland. Ironically, the sole survivor of the purge was Paul Chambers, who probably spent the next 10 years becoming addicted to everything and died from it before the 60s were out. Train was then picked up by one of the few authentic geniuses of American popular music and one of only five jazz musicians to make the cover of Time magazine, along with Louis Armstrong, David Brubeck, Duke Ellington and Wynton Marsalis, the great Thelonious Monk with whom he spent six highly productive months. It was during that time that Train decided to quit the old heroine, Cold Turkey, going through a nightmare withdrawal that he claimed resulted in a visit from God. Apparently, God was in a sporting mood that day. By May 1957, clean and newly motivated, he had recorded his first album as a leader, and in early 1958, Miles hired him back into his new band, where he recorded masterpieces such as Milestones and Kind of Blue, as well as his own excellent Blue Trainer. But it was 1959's Titanic Giant Steps album for Atlantic, which consolidated his reputation as the number one tenor man on the scene, displacing Sonny Rollins and setting out the first giant steps towards the musical force of nature Train was to evolve into. Recorded mainly in May 1959, only two weeks after work on Kind of Blue finished, with one additional song, Naima, named for Coltrane's wife, cut in December 1959, Giant Steps was released in February 1960. Like all of the albums we've looked at in our 1959 series, Giant Steps is an important musical document and, and a tremendously enjoyable listen 
Spiral might even be described as ear candy. Complex, gravity-defying ear candy. The album kicks off with its title track, a legendary piece which has become the cutting contest standard for tenor saxman ever since its release. Now, of course, Coltrane is doing this with a staggering 26 chords in each 16 bar pattern at 144 beats a minute, and he expects never to hear the same pattern twice, and for it to swing. The music is thrilling, it's like a, it's like a high speed chase where your brain is trying to catch up with Coltrane and pianist Tommy Flanagan's harmonic rocket car. But it isn't difficult or unpleasant, even though it's the hardest of the hard bop. You don't at first realise you're listening to one of the cornerstones of modern jazz performance because you're so caught up in the rush and the wonder of it. An odd bit of Giant Steps paraphernalia. It's long been touted that female jazz musicians and up and coming players don't especially admire Giant Steps the way the current generation of male players venerates it. I read an article with Froy Agre, the famed Norwegian saxophonist. She plays mainly soprano sax, so your tolerance for her music may vary. Where she says women, in her experience, tend to find the piece emotionally cold, where men find it a challenge to be overcome. It's an interesting thought, but I don't think a chap as famous for his humility as Coltrane would write something just to flex, and I find I get great joy and excitement from listening to the piece. Second up is the jaunty blues of Cousin Mary, a carefree enough tune, which seems to be straining at the seams to hold Train's torrents of notes and his huge tone as it gallops along trading solos. The only thing that really holds it back is it seems to run out of imagination at the close, even if Train's finishing flourish is sweet. Cousin Mary is dedicated to Mary Alexander, who took Paul Train in after his family moved to Philadelphia so he could finish high school. Tucked away inside A is, to me, the least interesting song on the collection, Countdown, which is based on an old jam standard called Tune Up. Now, I know a lot of people think very highly of this piece, but for me it just doesn't seem to go anywhere especially interesting, and the washed out and colourless rhythm sections sound like they're clomping along trying to keep up. I once read this was the starter piece for the chord substitution mode that was used on Giant Steps, but whatever its pedigree, after less than two and a half minutes it finishes with a wistful sign off from Coltrane. Whatever the sins of Countdown may be, they are instantly forgotten with the wonder of Side A's vertiginous closer, Spiral, which, as I have mentioned before, has a complexity which almost manages to hide itself behind a gentle swing, a sweet, vaguely arabesque, it's our old friend the Mixolodian mode at work there, tune, and the warm tone of Coltrane's horn. Train also throws in some dissonant little fills just to make sure we're still awake. This tends to be the forgotten song on the album, but it's one of my very favourites. Side B opens with the playful Saida's song flute written for Coltrane's adopted daughter. Ostensibly the simplest song on the album, it's pianist Tommy Flanagan and bass player's Paul Chambers swinging comp that allows for the persuasive groove of the song, and Coltrane tosses out snippets of engaging mini melodies here and there. Paul Chambers, famous for his bass solos in Miles Davis' band, obliges notably here. Naima, named for Coltrane's wife, is the most kind of blue-influenced piece, aiming for the oniric, chordless music he achieved as part of the band on that timeless record. In four and a half minutes, the song explores spatial and sonic relationships, while all the time retaining that searching dizziness, that essence that defies the empirical, that makes it not only a pointer to the next four years of Coltrane's career, where he cast off the fierce hard bop that characterised earlier songs on Giant Steps, and moved into modal explorations which culminated in Love Supreme. But it makes it one of the finest love songs written in the post-standards era of jazz. The album ends with a cool and rocking Mr. PC, another one where the band seems to be gasping at Coltrane's heel as he blazes away. The titular Paul Chambers and Tommy Flanagan make a brave attempt to comp, and Flanagan even gets in a lickety split solo, but it's drummer Art Taylor dropping a handful of epic bombs to break up Coltrane's increasingly frantic exit that ratchets up the excitement level to about 14 out of 10. Released in February 1960 to a muted critical response, Giant Step signals the end of the second phase of Coltrane's four-phase career. At first an acolyte of Charlie Parker until he joined Thelonious Monk, then alongside Sonny Rollins as the premier hard bop man, famous for his sheets of sound approach. 
until giant steps, Vince, a practitioner of modal textures, reinventor of unlikely causes, his next album contained his famous recording of My Favourite Things, which he reconstructs and deconstructs and then brings back as a ghost, and a surprisingly adept balance player, to his final phase as the aggressive, uncompromising avant-gardist whose work sometimes so little resembles music it has a unique fascination. John Coltrane died of liver cancer in 1967. The end was sudden and gave him little time to prepare his musical legacy. When he was asked by an interviewer in Japan in 1963 what he wanted to be in five years, Coltrane, a singularly decent, unassuming and guileless man, answered simply, a saint. He had to wait nine years, but thanks to the church of St. John Coltrane, he made it in the end.